And hi, this is Tony Duvel from Life Masters, and welcome to today's session, the One Minute Wisdom. And the subject today is the power of a go mindset, building a growth-oriented mindset for massive real success in every area of your life and business. So we should be together with you for about 50 minutes or so. So let's get started and get you into this new, the revolution of the power of the new mindset. Just a little bit about me. My name is Tony Duvel. I am founder of Life Masters and author of Swift Success, the revolutionary new mindset system for moving from whining to winning fast. I'm an uh, expert author. I'm a business optimizer. We help companies to quadruple their performance. I'm a specialist and my passion is in the field of personal mastery and team transformation. We help organizations do culture shifts using social network analysis. I speak around the world and essentially I'm a mindset mastery authority. So today I'm going to share with you the wisdom, the knowledge, the insights that I've gained from a variety of sources when I've been doing my research and, and investigation on packaging and positioning and giving you the tools to transform your staff, your team and your organization. I just want to set the frame of reference so you know where I come from and I have this saying which is Business is a waste of life if it's just about the money. So think about that. How do you approach your business? What is the real vision and meaning and intention of your business? Because we know with the shift in today's consciousness and the shift in the generations that we have in our organizations, it has to be more than just the money and a new car, Ferrari or Learjet for the boss. People want meaning. They want more than just give me the money. Money is a hygiene factor and not a motivating factor. So if you're wanting to increase and sustain performance, it has to go beyond the money factor. So what is it? Whilst you're sitting listening to me, what is the number one thing that keeps you awake at night? Think about it. What is the, the focus that you have that is, has you concerned that takes up your time? Is it an overload of information, work, issues with customers and sales, problems with cash flow and collection? Maybe it's staff problems. You know, staff can be your greatest asset, but they can be your greatest challenge as well. And what about concerns about the future? Certainty, political, you know, organizational, international. So what is it that keeps you awake at night? And maybe have some paper that you can make notes and write down on that piece of paper what is the main, you might have a few things, what is the number one thing that keeps you awake at night? Second question for you, what is your blind spot? There are three primary blind spots that I see when I'm coaching and facilitating in organizations. One is the leaders are so busy trying to win, to beat that they have this blind spot in them. The other one is they're too afraid to lose. They're fanatical about competing, but they have this creating the blind spot. And there are others who just come from a perspective of, no, I'm fine, I'm perfect, I'm okay, the problem isn't with me. And so they are too proud to have a look and see that maybe part of their challenge, part of their blind spot is preventing them from seeing what the real issues are in creating an optimized, high-performing organization and team. So why is this all important? Why should you worry about this new growth-oriented go mindset that shifts you from slow to go? Well, the number one thing that I see is change is happening a hang of a lot faster. In years gone by, your strategic time event horizon was sort of 5, 10, 15 years. But today that's down to 5, 10, 15 months. And it's getting faster. Competition is now global. The world is flat. Your competition could come from another industry and jump the industry fence and be your competitor within 30, 60, 90 days. We've seen it happen with people like the banking and the internet service providers where a bank became a service provider and overnight they smashed a few people's business models. A second part is we're becoming more humane in our business and moving away from this whole work, 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 like slaves, like robots, like automatons, 
to a more human, more caring, more connected kind of environment. And because we are literally, we are hardwired in our brains as social animals, we're starting to bring that in. We see social networking, uh, social network analysis and social selling and, and all of the, the digital marketing around social. The another thing is, we don't have as much certainty. In fact, we have much more uncertainty than we used to have in the past. And so by being sharp, by being clear, by being aware and awake and understanding what do you need to make sure that you are optimizing all of your resources and creating that certainty, which is one of the core human needs, that we need to understand this. And then we're becoming more conscious. We're becoming more humane. We, we're starting to get out of this head down, running like crazy for a hundred million and starting to look up and say, well, we have a triple bottom line now. It's, it's more than just the shareholders. It's also about the stakeholders. What is the impact on those people, on their families and on their life? And I always think, you know, typically most people in a JOB, by the time they're 60, at least 70, 80 percent of them are not going to be financially in a position to have an enjoyable life. And you might say, well, that's not my fault and that's not my problem. And I'm here to say, well, maybe if you were a caring leader, not a greeter, it might be part of your concern and consideration of adding more value to humanity and to the world. So why would you be listening to me today? What is your core need? What is the decision that you need to make? What is the dilemma that you have? Do you know exactly where your organization stands and what you need to be able to do next? Do you have a situation where you you may be doing well, but you can't slack off and you need to know where next to address? Do you have a plan that you need to measure how you're doing against that strategic plan? Because many times people do a plan and then it's just put in the cupboard and they never look at it again. Maybe you need to up the quality and professional image and behavior in the organization. And you know you need to improve something, but you don't know wh what it is that you need to improve. Because there's so many things that you can do, but are those going to impact the bottom line? We spend time and resource and money, but is it truly going to impact the bottom line? And how do we create common understanding of core priorities for our people of what needs to be done, what is important and what is vital. And what areas in our management and leadership do we need to improve that is going to actually impact the bottom line. And so the value and the benefit I bring to you today is some of the research around high performance organizations from the HPO organization overseas with Professor Andre Duval is I'm able to distill down their research plus research from other organizations in the dimensions of mindset, of leadership, of individuals and bring you this distilled information that will help you become a high performing organization. And so my goal is to give you the essential wisdom that you can have insights that are valuable that allow you to benchmark where you are, what you're doing, what needs to happen, how you measure your progress so that you can achieve your financial and non-financial results in a matter that puts you way ahead of your others in your same peer group that you can focus, you know that you're taking time and money and effort in areas that's going to work for you, to save you time, save you money, to get you there faster, in a more humane, more sustainable, and more enjoyable way. And so we talk about swift success. Swift success is my model, it's part of my book, and it's about a whole process of making sure that what you be, do, and have is bringing you real success in the shortest possible way. So let's have a look. What is HPO or High Performance Organizations? There are five areas that Andre Duval has discovered from his academic level research over many, many years in global organizations across the world. And this is around high quality management, high quality individuals and teamwork, and, and openness coupled with action, a long-term commitment to results and focus, and a constant approach to improving and renewal and innovation. And when I had the radio station, we called it Canny, C-A-N-I, because that was the intention. It's this ongoing, in, incremental, incessant improvement and renewal and moving forward with that lockstep to make sure things happen. But because we only have a short time today, I'm going to be with you for this uh, session and be covering the whole concept around high quality individuals because the, my, in my model and the work that I do in my team building, 
we know that the foundation is the individual, the next level that is dependent upon that is then teams, and then the next level above that, which is business success, is dependent upon good and efficient and effective teamwork. But at the end of the day, you can't have a great business and an efficient and effective team if you have challenges with the people in your organization. So that's what I'm going to be looking to do for the rest of the session, is covering this people part of the process. So let's have a look. What do we know? What do I know from my research, from my work, from my studies, from my experience out in the market? We know that leadership and the context or the culture impacts about 50% of the performance results. In books like Good to Great and Gallup's research and all of our experience, we know that the organizational culture has huge impact. How the leader walks their talk. Do they have a vision and values that the staff find meaningful? Because if there's no meaning, you're going to then have to be the slave driver constantly whipping the people and you'll never have inspiration from them. You have to motivate and manipulate them. But you're never going to have them inspired for something because that inspiration is where it's sustainable and ever-increasing and that constant and never-ending improvement. And part of that spiral is about bringing happiness to your organization. We know that happy people achieve more success. People aren't happy because they're successful. People are successful because they are happy. We know from the work of Sonia, Sonia Lubomirsky where she's discovered that people have a natural happiness set point. So let's assume that's half of happiness. The other half of happiness in most situations, in most organizations, is typically around the situation where it's a reaction to the culture, it's a reaction to the leadership mindset. But if we can shift that individual's mindset, that second half of potential happiness, at least... 40% out of the 100% of happiness, we can get another 40% of in what we call intentional conscious happiness of happiness by choice rather than happiness by birth or, or happiness by experience. But it's a consciousness that a person says, in spite of the circumstances, I'm going to focus on what I can be, do and have, what does make me happy. And that around that, to support that, we know from our model, a science of happiness at work model, that pride and trust and recognition support that. So giving good recognition, creating a space where people can have great pride and, and trust. Because if you don't have trust with your teams and trust in your organization, you're paying a huge performance tax. And without question, in every single team building that I do or leadership development or staff process I go and do in organizations when we do the research or the interviews, trust is an issue. And it's a big issue but it's a big issue about a little thing normally. But we know that if you're going to have a high-performance organization, that that trust is the glue that helps teams perform. It helps if they have a mindset and a consciousness and awareness and a culture that enables them to be happy because this happiness brings a whole lot more energy and possibility in helping them achieve their potential. Just to help you understand where I come from, my kind of frame of reference that I have, where I come from, I look at success from three levels. Level one, if you're going to have a team, the individuals themselves need to be efficient, effective, happy, healthy, well-balanced, positive mindset, go mindset, resilient, agile, committed, high-performance individuals. Because those individuals then work together to make up a team. I've come from the background of hockey and we know from uh, Bruce Lipton's work, Biology of Belief, that 10% of a system controls a system in biology. And if 60% of that 10% are negative or positive, whichever way it is, they have the power to influence and impact. So it, the reality is 6% of a system controls a system. So you might have, and we know from Gallup's research, around the world that between 15 to 20 percent of people are engaged and happy and bringing their best with them and we know that the, at the other end of disengagement there's at least same kind of 15 20 percent of people are disengaged but they're actively uh, like a cancer destroying undermining and then the, the group in the middle the sort of 65 60 percent they just do what it takes to get their salary at the end of the month so self is the foundation then the team 
And once the team is sorted and balanced and aligned and visioned and energized and empowered with autonomy and mastery, now we start to do the business where we make the money, where we have the meaning, where we create the momentum and the mastery and the magic. So in all the work that we do, I work on the foundation of the individual first, then with the team, and then we optimize the business. And that's how we get companies to quadruple their performance, sort of from 200 million to 800 million. I don't know if you like it, if it would be worthwhile, but it would be a good idea if you wanted to grow your business. And we know from the research that engagement, which is a large part of the focus with Gallup and a lot of people around the world, it's a subset of the science of happiness at work, but because it's so prevalent, I just wanted to give you some information here that you can use as you're interacting, as you're communicating, as you're selecting staff and making sure that they have the go mindset. But these are the kind of questions that people have in their head when they're in an organization or people are coming into the organization or they've been there for a while, what typically causes disengagement or, or increases engagement. And the one core thing is, do I respect the mission? Does it have meaning for me? Do, do they have integrity in the methods of what they're doing? Does my boss actually support and advocate for me? Do I, can I wake up in the morning and, and feel proud of, and have meaning from the work that I do? Am I able to use my knowledge, my skills, and my talents in a variety of ways during the day rather than just you know, cleaning the toilet and pressing six on the calculator? Do I feel, and this is the human part of it, unfortunately, we are warm, fuzzy people and it's the warm way. Do I feel valued and do I feel appreciated? And this is a perception and it's situational in how you manage your people. But here's the wisdom. In employee engagement, the number one thing up to at least 40% of the engagement is whether or not the workers feel their managers are genuinely interested in their well-being. We know from research people join an organization for their, their vision, their values, and their mission, and what they get, the meaning and the benefit they get from there, but they leave their immediate supervisor because of a relationship and a perspective of you're not genuinely interested in my well-being. So think about that. What can you do? What's one thing that you can do with each of your staff in the next week that you can show them, tell them, let them feel, let them see that you are genuinely interested in their well-being beyond just show me the money. In the research that I'm going to show you around growth-oriented mindsets and this whole thing around grit, the work from Professor Stoltz and Reed, they interviewed HR people and employers around the world and what they discovered is that 97% of the employers that they spoke to say they put mindset ahead of skill set when recruiting. Their problem is how do they assess the mindset? What are the qualities that are needed by their organization and what are the qualities that the person is bringing to their... So we now know that mindset matters more than skill set. I would rather have a team of people that are highly resilient with a positive go mindset that don't have all the skills right now, but we can get it to them versus a group of professors with all of the knowledge, skill and ability in the world, but with a negative attitude and a bad mindset. I'm going to achieve more way ahead of you if you're going to have those professors. So think about your current hiring strategies. How are you assessing for mindset? Because if you're only assessing for skill set, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And I think I've got a little bit later in the UK, they spend close to four billion pounds in wrong fit, in replacing staff that are employed that do not fit the organizational culture. They don't have the right mindset. And we don't have the numbers in South Africa, but it, globally it's big numbers because people are using old ways of selecting and choosing. What is the real big goal? So what is the real big goal? Yours, your staff, the people that are working for you, your customers. What is the big goal at the core of their soul? If you look at the very bottom, it's happiness. We want to be happy. It's an ends goal, not a means goal. And so all of the blue blocks are the means goal to get the ends goal. So you might Start a company so that you can retire early, so you can spend time with a family which would make you happy. You might want a boyfriend or girlfriend so that you can find a soulmate and feel connected and get married so that you can feel happy. 
And so if you keep on asking why, 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 why are you doing this? 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 You'll get past the means goals, the material goals, the actions, until you get down to a feeling. And it's normally around this happiness. And for me, it's about sustainable well-being, where people thrive and flourish. What is the big deal for your business? What is the big deal that's going to make your business more appealing, that you can retain and attract high-quality talent in your organization? How do your people get happiness other than what I call orgasmic happiness when they go and do something for a moment, but it goes back down to their set point? And why is this important? Well, because, because your staff are your most important assets. They're the most important assets, but they're also your biggest challenge and your biggest advantage. Though people say, my staff are my most important assets, I don't often see them walking that talk and creating the experience for their staff. So whilst they can be your biggest competitive advantage, you need to optimize the resource, not maximize the resource because your competition can buy with vehicles, machines, technology today as technology gets cheaper and cheaper. But the real challenge lies in bringing out the best of the capabilities in your staff members and then synergizing that team. We have an activity that we do with stacking cups. We divide people into groups and give them cups and they then have to work together and collaborate and assign roles and responsibilities and performance and there's a whole issue around quality and speed but it always amazes me that some teams can do the the project that we give them in say 20 30 seconds let's just say 30 seconds there's some that can do that same behavior and activity which we had just recently in 18 seconds, and they sound that take 45 seconds. And then what we do, we give them a chance to practice and create leadership and assign roles and activities and find ways to optimize. And there are some people that cut that performance time down in half. And under the pressure of the moment, there are other people that double that time to double what they did initially. And so that is the challenge is because we're dealing with this warm way, this human that thinks and feels and reacts and has baggage and beliefs and hopes and dreams. As a leader, you have to find a way to optimize this resource. So think about it for a moment. What are the most valuable qualities that you need from your staff? What is the core number one mindset skill mindset aspect that you would need from your staff members make a note of it and see if you had a magic wand what is the number one thing that you'd have from them and then think about some of your staff how do they rate against that quality if 10 is ideal where are they now and what are one or two things that you can do to start to enhance that quality. And I'm going to show you 20 or 21 other qualities that the research has shown around the world of what HR managers need, want, and hope and dream for in their staff and their new hires. So how do you think your staff are doing with those qualities that you need so vitally? And what is it that you could do to start to transform that on a daily basis? These are the areas from Professor Andre Duval in his High Performance Framework that are vital in enhancing and actually impact the bottom line. Are the staff responsible and accountable? Are they able to be inspired? Because quite often you might find people have a mindset and a culture and an environment that it's like pushing wet string uphill and trying to motivate them and manipulate them. And they just cannot be inspired. And we know from the work around our tribal leadership, there are five levels of language in an organization. And if you've got one of the lower levels of language that's now part of the culture, it can be very hard to inspire and get them to take action and get traction in any kind of projects. They need to be resilient and flexible and agile. They need the right mindset you need a complementary team of people to support each other and then you need them to work 
incredibly well as a team. It's, these are five simple steps, but it can be a nightmare trying to achieve that. And so often I see people coming along to me and saying, please give us a quote. We want to do is team building. We want to go and have some fun. Fun is important, but just fun for fun's sake is a waste of time and money. Rather create a situation and a set of circumstances where you go and have fun experiences. So find a way to have team building that is fun, but it delivers more value around conflict resolution, complementary skills, knowledge, communication, relationships, connection, beyond just the fun part of the process. So let's look at this whole GO. What is GO? GO stands for Growth Oriented. And we now know from the extensive research that there are two ends of the scale. One is you're a fixed mindset person, and the other is you're a growth mindset person, or you're somewhere in between. And this is the amazing work of Professor Carol Dweck. And she basically, we have a situation where we know that if a person has a fixed mindset, we know how they behave. Their belief system is that their knowledge is fixed. They are not able to change their knowledge or their intelligence. And so because of that belief system, they avoid challenges. They give up easily from having some kind of challenges that seem too far out of their capacity to complete without them losing their self-worth and their self-esteem. They, they don't want to take the time and the effort and the commitment and put in the drive and have the grit to keep on going until they succeed, and so they give up very quickly. The moment you give them any kind of feedback, they take it as personal. It is criticism. It's undermining. It attacks their self-worth, their self-esteem, and their self-image. And so even though you're saying this is not personal, they will take it personally. And when they, they were around others, they are constantly comparing themselves to others. And the problem is we've created these mindsets, these fixed mindsets, because of how people were brought up as children. If you bring up your child and you give them approbation and appreciation and say, Johnny, you are such a clever boy. The moment he feels unclever, his certainty and significance is destroyed. Whereas rather than supporting a clever, intelligent parents that said, I'm so proud of the work that you put in. I'm so proud that you were resilient and kept on trying. I'm so proud that you kept trying new and different things until you achieved it. That programs and creates a different identity and different belief system. And so people who have got the growth-oriented mindset, they know that the brain is malleable and you're able to develop it like a muscle. And so they're open to learn and grow and discover new things. Any kind of obstacles in their way, is, it's excitement for them to discover new opportunities. And so they persist and they, until they push through it. They understand that success means work. Achievement means work. It means persistence and determination and going the extra mile. They love to get the feedback and the understanding and third-party perspectives of how can I improve? How can I grow? And they're inspired and inspire others by their success. And so although well, the, these are the two extremes, you'll find people in between, and it might even shift based on their moods and the culture in the organization. But you want more of a growth mindset and an understanding than you want of a fixed mindset. As a manager and as a leader, you need to design and build and maintain a culture that supports this growth-oriented mindset. You need to make sure that you're giving appreciation and validation that supports the growth-oriented behaviors that you want. Because this is the foundation. When a person comes to you, you need to know, are they a go or are they a no mindset? The work that Carol has put out is incredible to support that information professor stoltz and from the reed employment company when they did their research they found these 21 qualities were the qualities that most people looked when they were employing staff so have a look at these commitment honesty contribution drive collaborative purposefulness resilience agility energy in your space what do you think are the top three mindset qualities that you would filter for and like your staff to have? What are the top three aspects of this high-performance team, high-performance person, high-performance organization that you would like to have? 
and then I'll tell you the order of what the rest of the world thinks, and you can see how you align up with that. So maybe make a note. What do you think is top number one, number two, and number three qualities that you your staff need in your workspace, in your environment, and in your industry? Here's what the rest of the world think. Commitment is number one. Honesty, number two. Trustworthiness, number three. And down to flexibility. Then contribution, drive, morality all the way down. And then collaborative, focus, balance, openness, and agility. These are the order of what most other people in HR and employment and management believe. And the challenge that we have, the fact that commitment is number one and agility is the last in the 21, all of these were vital within a level of 2-3-4% of each other in total. So if 95% agility and 97% said trustworthy and honest in commitment, these fitted into a very narrow band of these are essential skills that I want my staff to have all of, not just one or two or three, but when forced to commit to a priority, they said commitment was number one and honesty and trustworthiness and adaptability and accountability were vital. But the others weren't very far behind in that order and that research. So my question to you is, how do you rank on these scales of these? How do your staff rank? How's the team mindset? Because when you have a few people together, you have the mindset of the individuals, but you also have the team mindset. What is the organizational mindset like pertaining to these? And maybe it would be worth your while to do some kind of analysis and assessment. And if you're interested, we could help you with it. So, I just want to go a little bit further into Professor Stoltz and it's James Reed that did this research and they talk about global good and grit. I've added in the growth to make it the fourth G, but these are the four aspects that you need. Global good and, and grit are high levels of those 21 mindset qualities. So you can have each one of them has, has a few underneath the subset, but essentially it's about having a grit mindset, having the wherewithal, the passion, the persistence, and the drive. The good is about goodness, about honesty and trustworthiness and truthfulness. And then the global is about mindset and knowledge and aware and care. The growth part comes from Carol Dweck. But essentially it's that G, the G-O Get going, get moving, get the right mindset that shifts from slow to go. The, f the foundation and the energy of this whole mindset thing also comes around happiness. The problem is when we talk about happiness, what do you mean by happiness? And a happy, happiness is a word on a can, it's a label on a, on a bottle, but what's the contents? And I know, like in the people in sort of north and southern hemisphere up at the, the polar caps, they've got something like 15 or 16 words that describe snow. You know, we've got one, it's snow. They've got 15 or 16. And so happiness, we've really got three kind of categories of happiness, with the difference being the impact and how long the impact lasts. And so the first level is what I call orgasmic or rock star happiness, which lasts, it's just, it's there, it comes, it peaks, and then it dies down back to your baseline level. And that's when you give somebody an increase, or you give them a pat on the back, or you, you give them something that has some appeal, and it's a pleasure, it's fun, it's, ex it's exciting and interesting, but the impact doesn't last for long, it's not sustainable. The second level is what we call flow, and that's about doing work that you love, doing work that fits your talents, where you you fall into that, that mesmerized space where it's, time just flies and you, you lose track of time, but you're fully engaged, you're fully committed, you're using everything that is part of you. And that lasts longer, that happiness lasts longer. But the real happiness comes from two components. One is the person's foundation and their conscious choice and then the higher purpose and meaning and those put together when you get that recipe right the people the commitment the energy the team dynamic and the results are unbeatable and that's at the level that we help companies double and triple and quadruple their performance we help people 
transform their thinking, feeling and action. So my challenge to you is how do you do the same? How do you get this meaning and magic and mastery and mindset to get behind the higher purpose than just the money, just the business part of the process? Because as the new younger generations come in, this is going to be your biggest challenge. And we know that more money doesn't give sustainable happiness. More money does bring happiness to a point, but there is a line where adding another zero or two zeros doesn't change happiness. And we've seen this over and over again. So the real challenge for you now is how do you herd cats? Because if you've got 100 staff, you're trying to herd cats. And back to the work of Dr. Andre Duval, they have found that if you're going to optimize your environment, you need to make sure that you have a performance drive in your space, that it's everything that you do, whether it's structurally in the organization, in the strategy, and the the responsibilities or the behavioral activities are all aligned in one direction. And so to achieve that, you need to make sure, number one, that responsibilities and accountabilities are clear and structured, that the reports that you get have the right content that allow you to drill down quickly and simply at the core areas that you need to be able to manage and monitor. I've seen people have huge printouts, and all they do is they look at the one page one or two, and they ignore the rest of the stuff. So somebody's taken a huge amount of time to make this. But once you understand exactly what it is that you need, what are the core touch points that you need to monitor, then you can start to to distill that down into incredible reports. Obviously, you need to make sure that the integrity of that data that you are measuring and collecting, collecting, presenting is top. I've heard of many situations where the board has removed new management people because they were filtering out the information and the board didn't have stable, reliable, integrity information with which to make the decisions and the long-term choices that they had. The manageability of this information is vital because we talk about big data today. And we are now have volumes and volumes and volumes of data, but we don't need it all. We can distill it down to core touch points as you go higher up the organizational ladder that you can have five or six or seven or ten core touch points to see how's this doing, what is it happening, what is it impacting, and yes, we're in, we're in a good space or no, this needs attention. Number five is accountability, and and this on its own can be a whole workshop and a whole process in an organization, especially in governments and even in large organizations. This accountability is not clear back to the top, that responsibility, and to making sure that people have accountability and consequences and rewards and there's meaning and there's value and it's held clearly that people are clear on the priorities and the accountability. Number six is your management style. And this is back to leadership style, back to culture. The way you manage your people, your energy, your dynamic, your languaging, your tone, your tempo, the whole shooting match, it creates the culture that creates a positive or negative, what I call pH, like your pool. If your pool is acidic, you're going to have algae and green chochas growing in your pool. And it's the same in your culture. If your culture is acidic, you start to have politics and undermining, politics and undermining and backbiting. And so your management style and the culture you create controls that. Seventh, action orientation is so important. So many people talk and talk and talk, but it's not put into behavioral activity where it's clear what's required and how it's measured, managed, and monitored. Communication is vital, and I always see in companies, communication is one direction, whether horizontal or vertical, but it's not clear, it's not bidirectional, it's, it's not monitored, and there, I know there's research from Stephen Covey that the executive, at the executive level, the strategy and what's required doesn't cascade down to the front line because they know less than 5% of what that, that strategic vision is. And then reverse upwards, the guys in the, the executive suites have a less than 5% understanding of the day-to-day challenges that the people at the front line have. And so challenge is the challenge of communication is always a big one. Make sure it's clear and it's vital and people understand and they feed back to you. And then alignment of everything, alignment of the organizational structure, alignment of values, alignment of behaviors, alignment of team missions and visions and behavior patterns and measurements, aligning everything that you get your cats into a really good and manageable team. 
the leadership context, as I said earlier, you control 50%. The fish, the problem with the fish is it doesn't actually know it's in water. And same as business, people don't understand they're in a culture, not their home culture. And that's a part of the problem is people bring their home cultures. And now this business space is a mishmash of everyone's own cultures. And that's not acceptable if you're going to have a high performance team. You need to explicitly have clear vision, value, direction, rules of engagement. This is what we accept and this is what we don't accept. In the beginning, you need to manage it because whether you've intended or not, you have a culture of this is how it gets done around here. And new staff can get infected and affected and programmed by people that are, and it's typically the dissatisfied ones that take on the new staff and say, beware, watch out, don't do this, watch out for that. And so because they knew, they learned very, very quickly. So do you have an environment where growth is praised, where people can take chances, where they're encouraged to explore and discover and, and grow? What would have to shift for you in your thinking, in your feeling, in your action? You have huge impact as a leader, as a manager on the people around you. If you're awake enough, aware enough, and you use the tools and the information that I'm sharing with you, here is your challenge. How do you shift out of the old mindset around work or money to this new interconnected social mindset where people are looking for meaning and stuff that matters, where they can be on purpose? How do you leverage it? How do you create that shift? How do you reframe the organization's vision, mission, values and process? that people are on purpose and doing stuff that matters to them. The challenge that you have is letting go of old baggage, letting go of old beliefs, old behaviors, the way it's been done for the last X hundred years, all your old stuff. And that's why I have the bag. It's time to shift. It's time to change. It's time to let go. It's time to re-engineer, re-innovate, and rethink your go mindset. So think about this. Take each one of your staff, or if you're going to be renewing your staff and getting new staff, how do you select for mindset? What kind of process do you put in that selects for mindset and their work ethic? Because they, they could still have a, a go mindset and not have a really good work ethic, so you need to be, be aware of that. How do you understand and get to handle and understand what your culture is? Because by the very fact that you might be the boss, when you're going to go and see the staff, you know, when the boss is away, the mouse will play. When the cat's away, the mouse will play. And so the moment you come back, they're not necessarily going to tell you the truth. So how do you discover what the culture is? Because it could even be department-wise that there are different cultures. And do these new people coming in actually fit the culture and the demeanor and the space that, that is required there from an energy, attitude, and mindset process? And then do they have the talents and do they have the skills? And like I mentioned earlier, the, the last figure I just saw recently in the UK is that companies lose $4 billion a year from misplaced people that it don't fit in. And it takes them between 12 to 16 months to discover that they are misfit. And there's huge disruption in their organization because of the way they have made their choices based typically on skills. And there, there were companies like Zappos, I was trying to think of, is yes, you have to make sure that you have a skill set to do the job. But they also want to make sure that you fit the culture and you have the right mindset. You might be an expert with the right skill set, but if you don't have the right mindset and, cu and culture fit, they won't take you. And that's how Tony and the team have protected and made sure that they have such an incredible, world-class, high-performance organizational mindset. And if you're a manager, you need to understand this. Whatever actions you are taking, whatever change management decisions and processes you are doing to shift and enhance and improve, the, the human brain is three times more programmed to avoid pain than to move towards pleasure and reward. That's just how it's hardwired. Even if they're conscious, awake and aware people, the biological hardwiring of the human brain, this is the work of David Rock, is amazing in the neuroscience. We can now see when something happens and they've got a, a scan on the brain. 
The moment you threaten somebody's status or their certainty or their autonomy or their relatedness or fairness, there are parts of the brain that flash. They are unconscious. And these can happen up to seven seconds before a person is consciously aware of it. And so they're in reaction. So be astute. Be smart. Be swift. Think about what you're going to do. Think about how it's going to affect the person in one of these scarf dimensions. And we use this when we're doing our leadership and our team building to help people to become aware themselves so that they can create mastery of their reactions to response, becoming response able rather than just reaction. So here's my challenge for you. We talk about well-being and thriving and flourishing. What can you do? that will transform your staff, your team, and your performance ir- ir- incredibly. Here's what I would suggest. Like I said to my model in the beginning, number one, do something personal for the person. Give them training, give them coaching, teach them to become conscious and mindful and aware of what go mindset is and how they master it. Second level, do team building, team development, team dynamics using processes like appreciative inquiry that are positive, potent processes that are safe, that enhance relationships and connection and communication and innovation and alignment of vision, mission and values and clarity of what are we stopping, what are we starting, what are we continuing. Then you can then move it up to the business level and using appreciative inquiry or blue ocean innovation or any one of the the lean processes that you can use or agile processes to say, right, how are we going to optimize our business? But there are little things that you can walk away right now from this session that you can go and do with your staff, with your loved ones, with your family. And the number one is give some kind of recognition or a validation or appreciation. We have a special process we do at the end of most workshops. And without question, there's crying, there's, well, there's tears and happiness and joy and rebuilding of relationships. What can you do to make your staff feel validated and appreciated and respected? We know that the younger generations are looking for opportunities to grow, not so much the older people like myself necessarily, Um, although I'm a grower, I I love it, but that's my mindset. There are other people that are just in the J-O-B and they don't want anybody to rock the boat. But for those that are interested, that can be inspired to grow daily, to grow themselves, to grow the team, to grow the business, how do you shift the, the organization vision, values, mission, to a destiny cause and calling that has meaningful purpose for the individuals, that when they wake up in the morning, they're happy and excited to get to work to be part of this team. How do you get them involved and participating in meaningful ways that add value, that bring out their talents, that bring out their skills and get them to think and grow and use those Go Mindset resources? This is going to be hard for some people. Tell them that you need them, that you care for them, and that you will find ways to support them as part of the organizational family and team. We live in incredible times. And for me, business is a vehicle to uplift people. Profit is a byproduct. If you've got oxygen, you don't care about it. You, you don't worry about how much more oxygen you've got right now. You breathe. And money is the same thing. If you don't have it, then nothing else matters and that's all you worry about. But once you've got enough, for those around you that don't have enough, find a way to support, to encourage, to uplift and to grow them and to create a platform for them to build a better quality of life as well. I read this somewhere and I thought, I wish we could have this in business. Because there are many leaders, or greeders rather than leaders, that just treat their staff like a piece of dog poo. And for me, being truly human really means this. It's about connecting, valuing, appreciating, and treating people in a way that uplifts them and validates them. There are going to be people in your organization that you may have employed that wouldn't be able to fit into this kind of environment, but that's because you've now got the wrong fit person. But imagine if being truly human meant that you were treating everybody with care and dignity and respect. The problem is you have to have a free heart 
because it knows how to do this. The challenge is most leaders don't necessarily know how to do this. And that's your challenge. I love the sand timer because when you watch the sand running, that is your life, running. What are you doing with it? Are you enjoying it? Do you love it? Do you love what you do? Do you love the people that you're with? Do you love the impact that you have? Or are you a slave of time and a slave of money? Well, you have to make choices. You have to make decisions. You have but one life to live. The reality of life for me is life has to be about more than just the money. I have worked with, coached, facilitated, recovered people who have got gobs of money. But they've had strokes, or they've lost loved ones, or they've had heart attacks and died. But in all of my research and my time with these people, they come to a point at the end of it where they wished they hadn't worked so hard and it hadn't just been about the money. So what is it about then? What is it that makes your soul sing? What is it that would transform your organization into something that's meaningful and masterful for you, for your staff, for your stakeholders, for your customers? What one shift could you take that will bring the true value of life into the business beyond just the money? Here's the part where if you're serious about success and you want to accelerate your results and you are truly committed to creating a platform and a process and a place for your staff to build a way better life. And I'm assuming that you have enough money at this moment in time. And if you're not, then that is a symptom. And all of these things we've been speaking about are symptoms of situations and circumstances. So here's my offer to you. Do you want to double or quadruple your business, the bottom line, the money, the moolah? Do you want to make more money? Two, Do you want to transform your staff's mindsets, attitudes, energies, action and build them to give them the tools that they can become success gladiators and support and assist you in achieving your goals and dreams and align it with theirs? And you can see from our results, my three clients I've listed here, one we took a government department from 200 million to 800 million, IDT. Another client we took from 30 million to 50 million a packaging and conference company, and another clothing company, we doubled their sales in 90 days. Now, I don't know for you doubling your sales if it's any any real consequence in your life, but for many people I know, doubling your sales is more than doubling your profits because there are ways that we use leverage to optimize that whole process. So if you're, you're interested, you're committed, you're serious And notice that we went through interested, committed, and serious because so many people are interested in success, but they don't do much about it. And so they they watch TV, they look at things, they're interesting, but they don't do anything about it. If you're committed and serious about transformation of yourself, of your team, of your business, then we'd love to work with you. We've got tools from our Swift Success books in our workshops, in our team building, in our leadership development, and our social network analysis, we come with a host of tools to show you exactly what you can do. These aren't just some willy-nilly tools. These are academic level tools that have been proven to impact your bottom line, to deeply impact the individuals in your organization. As one person said, it was life-changing for the staff and life-giving for the business. You could have that too. And so here's my offer to you. If you're going to be the best and enhance your staff's grit and build a go mindset to them and understand how to leverage and use the HPO framework, we have a high-performance organization diagnostic that you run through and it then shows you where you need to focus your attention. If you want to bring more happiness, 
more resourcefulness and create a better place to work for people, then get hold of us. If you want me to come and run this in your organization for a group, we're happy to negotiate and create a win-win that is fair for all of us. But if you're going to make a million, I'm not expecting a million back from you, but I'm expecting a fair and reasonable share. So if you're serious and committed to transforming your slow-to-go mindsets, we're the ones that can help you. We can get to the core of the information, we can package a process and a system, and we can support you step-by-step step to transforming your individual, your teams, and your business. If you're ready, get hold of us. My number is 083-447-6300. That once again, that's South Africa, 083-447-6300. Or if you want a free assessment, a free Go Mindset assessment, or you want to work with us, email me on gofree at coachfree.com. That's, that is G-O-F-R-E-E at C-O-A-C-H. F of Freddy, R E E dot com. And this is me, Tony Duvell, founder of Life Masters and author of Swift Success. I've been with you, I've had a magic time with you. Time to go and take action, to put into process some of the stuff you've learned here. And if you want to work with us, we'd love to work with you and help you change the world. Namaste, and we'll speak to you soon. Goodbye. You can find more information about me on www.lifemasters.com. Dot co dot za that's l i f for freddy e m a s t e r s dot co dot za life masters dot coza or tony dovale speaks dot com t o n y d o v a l e speaks s p e a k s dot com just search for me tony dovale on google and you'll get me thanks been great to be with you bye